We're on, uh, okay, we're on Bamidbar, back to page, page 726. So there's, a, uh, there's an interesting medrash here. A medrash, there's a, the, the medrash on the Pasuk, on the very first Pasuk of Bamidbar. Vaydavra Hashem al Moshe Bamidbar Sinai, Ve'ol Moed Becha L'Chodesh Hasheni. Hashem spoke to Moshe in the Midbar Sinai. So um, there's a medrash that says that the Torah was given in three things. The Torah was given in fire, the Torah was given in water, and the Torah was given in a desert. And it doesn't mean that's where, where it was given, it means that it was given through these three things. That's what the Medrash, a very cryptic statement for the Medrash. The Torah was given through fire, through water, and through a desert. So that's a, that like all Midrashim, the Medrash needs to be understood. What, what's the Medrash getting at over here? What does that mean? A very cryptic statement. So there are different, different approaches here. Approach number one is that, approach number one is that it's describing for a for a Jew, what it takes to be what what it takes in 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 embracing Torah, Torah study, observance of Torah, being a being a loyal Torah Jew, seven twenty six, being a loyal faithful Torah Jew, what does it take? So, fire. What does fire always? What does fire always imply? What does what, is, what does fire imply to you? What's that? A will, a drive, uh, enthusiasm. So the, the, the fire refers to uh, the idea that in order to be a good, loyal Torah Jew, there's got to be a certain amount of drive, a certain amount of enthusiasm, a certain amount of, 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 of energy that we apply. You know, you get up in the morning, you got to go daven, you know, you know, and everyone else like, well, listen, mornings are always hard. I'm older than you. I've experienced more mornings than you, and they don't get any better. Uh, yeah, mornings are hard. That's the, those, the, those are the facts. Uh, and by the way, there, I heard from Rabbi Tath years ago. You know, when you wake up, there's always that feeling like, you know, I'd like to sleep a little more. And most people don't wake up in the morning like, oh, good. You know, oh, oh good, it's 6.30 and I get to go to Minion. You know, there's always that, I think, I think I'd like to stay in bed, especially in a cold Jerusalem winter where you're in a stone room with no heating. Uh, the easiest thing is to pull, to pull the, 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 the puch over yourself and go right back to sleep. So I only have one thing, Rabbi Tesswan said, don't make that decision horizontal. Get vertical. And once you get vertical, you get horizontal, you don't even have free choice. <laughs> There's no free choice when you're horizontal. Get vertical and then make a decision. And sometimes it happens, you're really not feeling well. I need to go back to sleep. Get vertical and then ask yourself, do I really need to sleep more or could I get up? That's just a, a, a what do you call it? The, 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 uh, the, the, to, to even out the playing field a little bit so that we make that choice. But in general, when it comes to, you know, you have an opportunity, somebody needs some help. No, oof, you know, all right, yeah, okay. I mean, I'd really rather continue watching what I'm watching, you know. No, it's got to be a fire. There's got to be an energy that we do it with without burning up other people, though. There's got to be energy, it means there's got to be a controlled energy, there's got to be a controlled fire. But fire represents the drive that a person has in Judaism, number one. Number two, there's water. Water extinguishes fire. The idea of water is that there are certain times water represents heaviness. You know, if you freeze it, it's even heavy. You know, ice, you know, it, 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 you pick up a bucket of water, but water is very, very heavy. Water represents the aspect of, in certain places, we should be lazy. We should be heavy. And that's when it comes to temptations that are inappropriate. Then we should, that's when we should activate coldness in ourselves. Like don't, be so, don't be so excited about running and doing something that you shouldn't do, which is usually the, works the opposite. In general, as a guide, by the way, if you're ever enthused about something, chances are it's not coming from the right place. Because Averas are something we're enthusiastic about. Mitzvahs we're not as enthusiastic about. That's called the Yetzirah. So if you ever got excited about doing a mitzvah, uh, you're, I'm really excited about doing this mitzvah. Uh, you're not excited about going to Minyan in the morning. So why, why are you suddenly excited? Do you know how many times I've been asked over the years? You're not going to believe this. Guys have asked me, should we go downtown or go somewhere and beat up missionaries? 
And isn't it a mitzvah? Right? So the answer is, are you, is it something you're looking, you, you'd like to do? Well, anything's better than learning Gemara. You know, if I got the choice of two mitzvahs, you know, go, go work out a, a piece of Gemara with the Tosos or go beat up missionaries. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, but uh, if you're so excited about it, it would be such a mitzvah, bigger people than you would be doing it. So if you're, if you're, if you're ever energized, enthusiastic about doing a mitzvah, sometimes a husband, you're at home, your wife needs help with the kids, and also you get a phone call, they need help straightening out the sedurim in the shul. And you're all excited about running to the shul to help them in the shul over there. Just say, why, why are you so excited? How come you're not excited to help your wife with the kids in the, in, in, at home? And what, what about that? There was a guy once who came, there was a guy who was studying in Kolo. And he, for a few days, he came late to the Kolo. You know, he's supposed to be there a certain time. So the head of the Kolo came to him and he said, uh, you know, Chaim, what's, uh, what's, uh, what's doing? He says, listen, I know a woman, she's all alone with four kids. And uh, every morning she needs a lot of help. You know, so I, so I help her. He says, wow, that's very noble. Who, who's this woman? He says, my wife. You know, she's also a person. She also needs help. That's also a mitzvah. Yeah, so if it'd be a widow on the, down the block, so then a guy would run and do a mitzvah and think he's the Chavetz Chaim. Uh, what about his wife if you leave the house and she's alone? Say, you know, they, if you're so excited about it, that's always a gauge to wonder why am I excited about this mitzvah. Water is heaviness. Water is heaviness. And, you know, I'm, 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 I, here I should activate some laziness. What's a desert? A desert is, it, it could, sometimes a desert is, is actually, we'll get to that in a second. A desert represents its complete hefker. Anybody who wants can come into a desert. Can't go, can't go traipsing into a museum with priceless paintings. You know, you're there, there, there's a guard. And you can't just walk into a museum. You can't walk into somebody's backyard. You can't walk into somebody's house. And you can't walk into the ballpark because there's an admission fee. A desert... There are no guards in the desert. Anybody who wants to walk, desert is called Hefker. It's ownerless, it's Hefker. There's, anybody who wants, it's, 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 it, nobody owns anything there. The idea of a desert is a person has to develop the attitude, I'm Hefker, meaning taking ourselves out of the equation. Because most of the decisions we make in life, we have a personal bias in that decision. And when it comes to serving HaKadosh Baruch we have to take that personal bias out. The personal bias could be whether it's doing a mitzvah, it could be whether or not making a life decision. Get myself out of the picture. We're very, very, there, there's, a, there's an interesting story. You know, when, let's go back to the original sin. So, so Chava is tempted by the serpent to eat the fruit. And he convinces her she's not going to die because she was told if you do eat it, you will die. He convinced her somehow. She eats the fruit. Then what does she do? She gives it to her husband. Says Rashi, why did she give it to Adam? Why, why, why did she give the fruit to Adam? She was worried, what if I die and he stays alive? Says, so if I'm going, he's going too. That was her, that's what Rashi says. <laughs> uh, Uh-oh, what if I do die? Oh, Adam, <laughs> dinner. <laughs> She's going to take him with. Why? Well, you know, uh, you, you know, so everybody asks, well, where would he get another wife from? Uh, well, he got another rib, yeah. yeah there are more ribs there where, where that came from. So, so the, the truth of the matter is she wasn't, it wasn't an act of selfishness as much as her, her calculation was, if he sins also, then neither of us are going to die because there will be no world. So that was her calculation. Okay, whatever it was, the commentaries asked the following question. Before she ate the fruit... One way or another, she had convinced herself she wasn't going to die. After she ate the fruit, all of a sudden she's nervous about dying. So what changed? So uh, I saw one of, the, one of the commentaries, he says like this. There's once this uh, anti-Semite back in Russia. There's an anti-Semite. There's a Jew living on his property. He used to, you know, the, you had the, the, what he called the feudal lord and the Jews uh, renting the property. And this Jew had a very unique ability. He could predict the future. So this anti-Semite, Igor, he, he belonged to the anti-Semites club, and they had their annual meeting. And he goes to the annual meeting and he starts boasting about, I got this Jew on my property who could predict the future. And Ivan can't stand the fact that somebody may have something he doesn't have. So Ivan says, nobody could tell the future, that's ridiculous. He says, no, no, my Jew could tell. He says, you can't have, nobody could tell the future. He says, I'll bring him, I'll prove it to you. So next year they have the annual meeting. And Ivan goes over, Igor goes over, he says, Yankel, you're coming with me to the meeting. Oh, this, this can't be a good thing. So Yanko goes with Ivan Igor to the meeting, and they have a big stage set up. And as soon as he walks in, Ivan is standing there and says, Jew, get up here. So 
Yanko walks up to the stage and says, okay, listen, Jew, I was told you could tell the future. I claim nobody could tell the future. Now I'm going to put you to the test. Tell me what day you're going to die. So, so, so Ivan has a plan. If the Jew says any time in the future, so well, I'm going to die, you know, uh, three years from now, he's going to pull out a gun and say, you're wrong, and kill him on the spot. If he says, I'm going to die today, he's going to wait till nightfall and say, you were wrong, and kill him. So you Yankel sitting there stroking his beard. Uh -huh. He says, Jew, what day are you going to die? What day am I going to die? What day am I going to die? I'm going to die on the same day you die. So he reaches for the gun, and all of a sudden he freezes. And everybody's going, come on, Ivan, come on. What happened, Ivan? Chicken, buck, 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 buck. What happened, Ivan? And I like, well, let's think about this. You know, you know, what's, I don't, what happened? What changed? A minute ago, you were sure nobody could tell the future. All of a sudden, now you're, now you're nervous about the future. All of a sudden, all of a sudden what, what in the, like they say on the airplanes, in the unlikely event that he happens to be the one guy who could tell the future, then what? They kill him now, then you're going to die too. So the commentators say, that's what happened to Chava. Before she ate the fruit, she had a personal vested interest. I want to eat that fruit. So she convinced herself nothing's going to happen. After she ate the fruit, all of a sudden, whoa, 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 what if something's going to happen? That means that this guy was convinced nothing's going to happen. Nobody could tell the future. All of a sudden, you became personally involved. Oh, well, whoa, this could have serious ramifications. Uh, oh, at that point, he puts the gun away. So in a, a desert represents taking ourselves out of the picture completely. It's ownerless. It's after. I am, I'm yours, God. I'll do whatever you want me to do. Just tell me what to do. I, and I, but, yeah, but, yeah, but, no, no yeah, buts. That's the, that's the first idea here, okay? Idea number two, the commentary say, is that we find fire, water, and desert represent what we call Mesiris Nefesh. In the most, Mesiris Nefesh literally means giving up your life. In the most extreme scenarios, we find that people willing to give up to die for the cause. We find it by fire. Where do we find it by fire? First Jew in history. What happened to Avram Avinu? When Nimrod told him to bow down to the idols, what did he do? He said, throw me into the fire. I'm not, I'm not going to bow. And he survived it. But he was willing to die for the cause. Water. Where do we find water where people were willing to die for the cause? At the, split, at the splitting of the sea. Very good. The, the Jewish people marched in. Nachshon ben Amina. No, according to one man, he just jumped in, was up to his neck. And Listen, it wasn't like the sea split and then they went walking through. You're walking into the ocean. You're walking into the side of the ocean. You're walking into the sea. And then when they walked into the sea, then the sea split. But if somebody would tell you the swirling, the sea is, you know, go, go take a walk into it. Go take a walk. I will walk into a swimming pool. They, they go all walk. So water represents being willing to give up, for the, to die for the cause. And the third situation was the desert. The Jews are in Egypt. And they're willing to march out to the desert. What's in the desert? They got no food. They got no, they have limited supplies. You know, you drive, take, take a drive to the Dead Sea over here. On the right, if you look on, off on the right, as you're driving down the sea, you see, you see desert over there. I tell you, here, here, take a canteen, go start marching out into the desert. Like, what, what you know, no. <laughs> like, just no. Well, how can I do it? The Jewish people were willing to march out into the desert. That represents what it takes in the extreme cases for a person to for a person to embrace a Torah lifestyle. Sometimes it's hard. Now, person says, it doesn't always involve dying for the cause. I mean, give you a couple of examples. Maybe a couple of examples. It doesn't always involve dying for the cause. But sometimes it, it certainly involves what we would call Messiris, what they use the term Messiris Nefesh, which literally means dying. Sometimes a person has to sacrifice. A person has to, has to give up a whole lot for his Judaism. So they had, let me give you a couple of examples. Did you ever hear of the Maram Rotenberg? The Maram Rotenberg was the... Uh, he was one of the Tosafists, one of the Bali Tosos, the Maram Rotenberg. And he was taken capture by the Goyim. They put him in a tower. The Jewish people wanted to ransom him. They wanted to ransom the Maram Rotenberg from, from, from the, he was, I don't know, they're trumped up charges and they, and they kidnapped him. They put him in the, in, the, in, the, in the tower. And the Jewish people wanted to, what do you call it? They wanted to ransom him. But the halacha is you don't ransom captives for more than the value. It's a, it's a Gomorrah and Gittin, as a matter of fact. Gomorrah says, you don't ransom captives for more than a certain value. Why not? Because if you do, then all that'll do is motivate the kidnappers, the, the anti-Semitic kidnappers, to kidnap more, more, more people. You know, so there's, a, there's a very delicate balance here. 
the Jewish community, he was the Godel Ador, the Jewish community wanted to ransom him. The Maram Rottenberg from captivity told the Jewish people, do not ransom me. Because Allah says I can't be ransomed. They said, yeah, but you're the leader. Said, no ifs and buts, but do not ransom me. He died in captivity. He died in captivity and it was seven years, I think it was seven years, till eventually they were able to recover his body, Tiberia. That was, that was the, the Torah says he can't, but, but at the cost of personal, yeah, yeah it, it, he gave up his life. Now, there are examples of people, there was a guy in Russia, a Jew, well, a Rav went to Russia once, and he met this Jew, an elderly Jew, and this elderly Jew told him, I'm, my nickname is the Yom Kippur Jew. So he says, why are you called the Yom Kippur Jew? So he opens his mouth like that, he's got no teeth. He goes, yeah. Why are you the Yom Kippur? He says he was in Siberia. And in Siberia, they were in forced labor. And the only way you could get off of work was if you were in the infirmary, if you weren't feeling well. Every year, on air of Yom Kippur, in order to not work on Yom Kippur, he would go to the dentist and have the dentist pull one of his good teeth so they could get out of working. That way he would have sick leave and he wouldn't have to work on Yom Kippur. So he'd have a tooth pulled in order to not worth it, work on Yom Kippur. And so he had no teeth left. But he smiled about it because he gave up. He was, I'm a Yom Kippur Jew. And they called, he said, I'm a Yom Kippur Jew. The stipler said the happiest day of his life. Stipler was the happy, what was the happiest day of his life? He said he was in the Russian army and it was Shabbos and they went and they, he had, they, they were forced, they were telling him he has to work on Shabbos. He said, I'm not working on Shabbos. So what they did was they said, okay, the punishment is running the gauntlet. And like you used to do to the freshmen in high school. Right, you line up on both sides of the halls and the freshies have to run through, right? And do you do to them whatever it is with whatever, whatever you can use in order to inflict pain on freshmen. Well, these weren't freshmen, these weren't seniors beating up freshies. These were a bunch of big, burly Russian anti-Semites with clubs. And there were 50 of them lined up on each side. And the stipler, when he was in the army, you know, back in the, he was younger, he had to run the gauntlet because he wouldn't work on Shabbos with every one of them smacking him with a club, a Russian big brother, and, and he went through, became out bloodied and bruised, battered and bloody. And he said that was the happiest day of his life, that he sacrificed for Shabbos. So that's okay. Now, there are, in our day and age, in our day and age, there are others. I'm gonna tell you an unbelievable story. This is documented, this is documented. And the reason I know it is I was asked this by one of the other rabbis. I was once at a bus stop, and one of the other rabbis came over and he asked me, he said, there's an interesting halachic shayla. <laughs> You're not going to believe this. So what happened? There was a, a chassan and a kala. A bride and a girl. They were engaged, an engaged from couple. And uh, they weren't married yet, they're engaged. And they decided one day to go skiing. So they went to the ski resort. And uh, this is documented. I think the case went either to the Supreme Court of the state of New York or it went to the Supreme Court of the United States. I'm not sure which one, but it's documented. It went to, you can look it up. You can look it up. It went to the Supreme Court of one of the, one of the, the okay, what happened? They went to the ski resort and they were on a ski lift. And it was late in the afternoon and the ski lift malfunctioned. And they were stuck dangling in midair. And uh, at a certain point, they started calling for help but everybody in the resort had already left. So at a certain point, they realized that this is a problem of what's called yichud, of a non-married couple being alone in a secluded area, which is prohibited according to halacha. So there's a problem of yichud, right? So what happened? They, uh, it's a problem, all of a sudden they realize, hey, you know, what do we do? So the kala, the girl, jumped out of the ski lift. She ended up breaking both of her legs. I know, I know, I know what you're wondering. I know what you're wondering. I, the answer is I don't know. You know, yeah. Why, why did she jump? Why didn't he jump? You know, first of all, we don't know that she jumped. She might have been pushed. <laughs> and, and so, so she jumped. She ended up breaking both her legs. And then there was the halachic question that the guy asked me was, under those circumstances, do you have to give up your life? You know, to, for, to, to avoid immorality, a person has to give up their life. For if, a guy, if the anti-Semite pulls out a gun and says, uh, you have to live with this married woman, or live with this woman, even a single woman. Live with this woman or I'll kill you. Right? The halacha is you have to die, like idol worship and, and murder. So the halacha over here, the question was, since in every area, for example, idol worship, 
not only the actual worshiping of idols is forbidden, but what's called Abu Zrayu, any of the subcategories are also forbidden. You have to give up your life for it. So is this considered one of those subcategories of immorality where you actually have to give up your life because you're not allowed to be alone? The halachas of Yichud, you're not allowed to be alone with a woman. Other she's your mother, wife, grandmother, or daughter, you're not allowed to be alone with her in a secluded place, which could be a locked room or, a, or, or out in the desert or, where, or on a ski lift. So, so the question was whether or not that now. I don't know what the answer is. I don't know what the answer is. The only one thing I know, she thought she was forbidden and she jumped. She was willing to jump. I could just imagine how that conversation went. <laughs> I, could just, I could just hear something like, Herschel, you know, we have a problem of Yichud over here. Listen, Hani, my rabbi said that it's okay. Well, my rabbi didn't. Ah! <laughs> and, uh, and now she goes. The men always know the leniencies, by the way. The women, the women are play for keeps. You know, like, like it's us or it's us or no, not playing around. The men always know, mm, you know, they you know, but it's like, <laughs> and she, and down she goes. So why did it, why did it go to court? Because they sued, they sued the ski, uh, what do you call it, the resort. So uh, they, they, they lost in court because the, the non-Jewish judge couldn't wrap his head around the idea that a couple can't be on a alone. You know, he's he's thinking like, listen, girl, you don't like your date, so don't go out with the guy. You don't have to go. And you have to jump out of a ski lift. <laughs> so that that's so the point. <laughs> it's documented. Go you check it. It's doc, documented incident. And uh, uh, what do you call it? The point is again, I don't know what the halacha is, and I wouldn't be on a ski lift because I'm scared of heights anyway. And and so, but at the end of the day. That means it's, this is somebody who, hey, yeah, and we're playing for keeps over here. That's what's called Mr. That's what that's what it means. That 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 a what do you call it? That, that a the fire, water, and mead bar, which we have precedents for people actually be willing to give up their life. To us, it, 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 in in a day to day living, there are certain situations where you know, listen, it's tough. Something. Let's say you're on an airplane, and they don't have your kosher meal. Now you're going to be 12 hours on a plane with a banana and an apple. You're not going to die. You're not going to die. You'll be okay. You'll make it. If, it, if it's life-threatening, then you can eat non-kosher food. But you're not going to die. You'll make it. You'll be hungry, and you'll be in a bad mood. And for, for 2000 bucks, you expected better than this, and you order a kosher meal. They didn't have it. What are you going to do? At the end of the day, that's a little, it's a little mysterious snuffish. A little, you know, you got to... You gotta what do you call? You gotta you gotta push for the cause. That's what it could come to. That's what it takes to be a loyal Torah Jew. Okay. Oh, I'll tell you two two other two other incidents. Oh, you're gonna love this. There was a little Russian kid here in Israel. He became the Russian kid started getting from. He went to a he he, he was uh, what do you call it? He was he was starting to they they have this this happens where kids are influenced by other kids. He wanted to be a, a his parents were not having it. And his mother one day said to him, it was Shabbos, and she said to him, you know, uh, what's his name, uh, Vladi, uh, uh, Vladimir, uh, you, didn't, you didn't do your homework. So I can't do homework, it's Shabbos, I can't write. So Vladimir, sit down and do your homework right now. They got, things got a little, you know, got a little. So Vladimir got up, and he wasn't, Mommy, I'm not right. I mean, he's a Russian kid, he's not gonna give in so fast. So he got up, and she was giving him a hard time, and he walked over to the door, and he put his fingers in the door, and he slammed the door on his own fingers. He broke his fingers. Mommy, I can't write now. Hmm? Was a little kid. How do you like that? How do you like that? Now, don't go doing that, and don't anybody go and say, yeah, I was at our Samach. They said we got to break our fingers. You know? <laughs> it's, not, that's not, they, they, it's just the idea that people do take it seriously. That's the idea. They, people take it seriously. That's the, that's the uh, what do you call it? Okay. Let's go on. That's as far as fire, water, and what? Oh, you had, you had asked, the, uh, there is another approach over here. Now listen, there's also a very, very important idea. There are two stages in serving, in serving Hashem. Stage one is you have a temptation. And you, you know, you have, you have a temptation, you're interested in doing something forbidden. There's a, a, a trafe pepperoni pizza in front of you and the fire is burning, and what you do is you douse the fire with that energy of water. You activate the willpower, no, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna give in, I'm not gonna indulge. That's a very high level. That's the fire and the water. 
The Torah is given fire, water, and a desert. There's a third level. The third level is where I'm already beyond it. I don't even have that desire. It doesn't even speak to me. Now, this goes to a basic concept that Rav Dessler presented, which is called the Nekudas Habachira. Have you ever heard that concept? The point of free choice. There's the point of free choice. What does that mean? If I were to put a big piece of ham on the table right now, is there anybody in this room who would even have a battle about ham, with ham? Not one person in this room has that battle. Nobody would have that, nobody would have, you look at no matter how hungry you are, you're not gonna eat ham. Just not gonna happen. Even more, is Yom Kippur a difficult day? Fast dining Yom Kippur, Kippur's a difficult day. Is it a test? I don't know anybody who Yom Kippur is a test. The people that I know, Yom Kippur is not even a test. There's just nobody's gonna eat on Yom Kippur, it's just not gonna happen. It's hard, it's grueling, it's, I'm hungry, I got a headache, and I, nobody's gonna eat on Yom Kippur. I don't know anybody who's even been tested by Yom Kippur. However, let's say I would put something on the table right now, and it's got kind of a dubious hechsher. It says K on it, or it says O-R on it, which stands for Orthodox, right? Isn't that what O-R stands for? <laughs> Trademark O-R. I put, it, I put a piece of, it's like, what dubious hechsher. For some people, that's not a test. I'm not going to eat food that I don't know where the food came from. For some other people, it's like, hey, listen, you know, well, I, nah, nah. for some people, that's not, it's not a test for them. So there's a shifting scale of test. There's a shifting scale that we all go through on a regular basis. This morning, I woke up. I did not have a test whether or not I'm going to daven, and I did not have a test of whether I'm going to put on tefillin. I'll tell you where I did have a test. I was a little tired. And my test was when I got to Shimon Esrei, should I activate a little bit more energy and try to concentrate? Or should I kind of just race through it because I'm not really in the mood to daven right now? Right there, there was a test. For other people, even that wasn't a test. Their test was, should I activate every kavana of the Arizal when I'm davening and saying Hashem's name? Because that's a higher level. Our, we have a shifting scale, a shifting test scale. We want to create a situation where we become a desert. What does that mean? That these things that look like a test, this is no longer a test for me. That's not a test. At one point, there was a test. This is no longer a test. That's the desert. That we want to constantly move that point up where there's enough below that point that's all desert. That's not even, that's not even a test. My test is at a higher level now. That's the different. That's that's the 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 fire, the water, and the uh, and and the desert. Okay. Go on ahead now to the second chapter. Goes through the various families of the Jewish people, and then on um, page seven thirty two. Perik base, six lines from the top. Vaydabra Hashem on Moshe v'Aaron Lamar. Ish al diglo, every man by his flag, beosos with signs, levesa vosam by their families, yachanu b'nei Israel, mineged saviv lo oboid yachanu. They're all going to camp around the oamoid. And then the Torah describes how they're going to be lined. Ve'akod min cheva b'kebam Mizracha on the east side, degel machane Yehuda, it's the camp of Yehuda, and it's going to be made up of three tribes. It's going to be Yehuda, Yisachar, and Zvulun. I'm not going to read all the Pesukim now. They're going to be on the east. There are going to be three tribes with one main tribe, the camp of Yehuda. They're going to be on the, on the, on the, on the east, on the south, on the north, and on the, on the west. And there are going to be three tribes. And they're going to be divided around. All three are going to be drive, drive, divided around. Twelve tribes, three, 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 three. And then in the middle, you're going to have the Levites. And the Torah describes a very, very impressive-looking organized camp of the Jewish people. It wasn't just one big tish right, where, where everybody's grabbing for kugel. It was very, very organized and very, very divided up in an in a, in a, in a, in a, in extremely, in a, in a, in a, what do you call it, very, very, uh, 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 what's it called, regimented. So there are two questions here. Question number one is what's the Torah trying to communicate with this? And Ryan Cutler says the Torah is talking about here about what we call in Hebrew Seder. In English, the rough translation is organization. 
That means a Torah Jew has to be organized. We have to be, everything, our day should be organized. There shouldn't be random, haphazard. There are certain people, you look, watch these people, they go through, the, they're always five minutes late to everything. You always get the feeling, you always get the feeling if we would have gotten up five minutes earlier, their whole day would have been much more better adjusted. And it wouldn't be. They'd always be five minutes late. They're always missing something, can't find it. As I, they walk into the room, the room looks like it, look, 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 looks like it, it, you know, it, it just got hit by a tornado. And, and everything is, and a person learns with life experience, by the way, it takes time to get organized. But it costs you more time not to be organized. That one time, and not only that, sometimes it costs you big. Because at one time that you're, you know, you have a flight tomorrow, and finally, at a, you know, tomorrow morning, your flight's at noon, tomorrow morning you decide to go, go, go gra grab your passport. A, you either can't find your passport, what did I do with that passport, where is my passport? Or finally you do find the passport, and because of a lack of organization, you see that it, that it expired three weeks ago, now you can't go on your trip. So it could cost you big time. So to be, no, there's extreme. You know, there are men who have every bill that's ever come to the house. You ever see these guys, they got a file cabinet with every bill. Well, nowadays, everything's computerized. They have every electric bill they've ever gotten, you know, for the last 20 years, they've gotten a file cabinet somewhere. Once in 20 years, they've needed one of those bills, and they've been so happy that, yeah, I got that bill. <laughs> they finally pull it out for you. And the rest of it is, uh, it, it, it could have been trashed a long time ago. The Torah is telling you, a Torah Jew has to be organized because organized physical existence means that we have an organized mind. I could look at a person, I could basically predict what his room would look like. You could tell how a person, I could basically predict what his room looked like. One guy, you could talk to the person, and this person's room is going to be neat, his bed's made with neat military corners. And you have another guy, this guy can't find his bed. Under, under the heap of whatever it is that's in the room. You can tell. There's a famous story. I heard this story when I was a little kid. I was in day school. There's a kid goes off to yeshiva. He leaves, he leaves, he goes to yeshiva out of town. And then his father, after a few weeks, his father comes to the yeshiva to see how he's doing. Is he learning well? He's there, well, how's, how's he progressing in yeshiva? So the father goes to the yeshiva, he comes home, and he says to his wife, Yankee's learning very well. So I, wow, you spoke to the Rosh yeshiva? No. You spoke to his Rebbe? No. You spoke to the Majgiach? No. You spoke to Yankee? No, I didn't even see Yankee. So how do you know he's learning well? So I just went up to his dorm room. Everything is organized. His shoes are neatly under the bed. His clothes are neatly folded. If he's got an organized room, then he's got an organized head, he's got an organized life. That means he's doing well. And if a person is, is if you walk into the room and the room looks like, uh, looks like uh, the theoretical possibility of matter without form, so then, 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 then he's living his life like matter without form. That's a, that's a pretty much, uh, there are exceptions, obviously, there are exceptions, but that's as a general rule. So organization, Seder, being neat, being more or less, everything is very, very, that's a Torah value, number one. Okay. Now there's a bigger question. If you take a look, this takes place in the second year. The Jewish people are divided up into these sections in the second year of their having coming out of Egypt. Why were they divided up? They came out and why not divide them up before they leave Egypt, divide them up into camps? Why is it that only in the second year are they divided up into these groups of three and everybody's told where you have to camp and where you put your tents and so on and so forth. What do you say, Israel? First, you're part of the bigger group. So you could have been part of the bigger group in the first year also. Why did it take till the second year that HaKadosh Baruch Hu divided them up? What do you say? They didn't build the oil mode yet. Excellent. They had not yet built the oil mode, so what? And therefore what? You're right. The, the it's oil. only after the So now they're surrounding the oil mode, and therefore what? You're absolutely right. The answer is, the oil moid is a centralizing force. The tent of meeting is a centralizing force. If you would divide people up before they have that centralizing force, you run the risk of factionalism. You have our group, we have your group, and, and there's nothing that's really uniting everybody. You've divided everybody. Here, we're united. First of all, we're united. We have the oil moid. We have our central focus. After that, you know, they once came to a Simcha Wasserman. Because you see that in Judaism, there are many different groups. There are Litvaks, there are Hasidim, there are Litvaks, there are Sephardim, there are Litvaks, there are Mizrahim. Yeah, you have all sorts of groups in Judaism. 
right? all sorts of groups. And so, so, why? Well, you also had 10, 12 tribes. You also have 12 tribes. Litvaks, right? You have 12, 12 tribes, all Litvaks. No, you have 12 different, 12. Ruvain, Shimon, they have a different job. They're the Torah learners. They're the merchants. They're the ones that, everybody's had a different job. So a, uh, there was once a rabbinic conference. So this, uh, there was a reform rabbi there. I forgot her name. And uh, <laughs> there's a reform rabbi. And this rabbi goes up to Rabbi Simcha Wasserman, Rabbi Chonda Wasserman's son. Rabbi Wasserman was, uh, was, 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 was in the Gedolim. And he says, Rabbi Wasserman, I want to ask you a question. How come there's so many different groups in Judaism? Why can't we all be one group? Meaning, why can't we all be reform, obviously? Why can't we all be one group? So Rabbi Wasserman, he started up with the wrong person. Rabbi Wasserman says, well, you know, the, 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 the Jewish people are like an army. In every army, you have different groups. You have the, the tanks, and you have the Air Force, and you have the, the Navy, and you have the Marines. And you have, they're, they're different groups. Every army has different groups in Judaism. Each, 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 one of, each group is a different branch of the army. Because the big spy says, in which branch of the army is the reform? Rabbi Wasserman says to him, listen, every army has deserters. <laughs> yeah. So the, uh, the yeah. well, you want to start up? You want to start up with Rav Wasser? So, so the, here there's an idea that there, we're divided up. But we're divided up with always, even today, you have Hasidim, Misnagdim, Sfardim, Ashkenazim, this group there, even among Hasidim, how many different Hasidic groups are there? How many different Hasidic Rebbes are there? How many, even among the Litvaks, you have Litvaks with this Minag, Litvaks that follow the Vilna Gon, Litvaks, you have every group, the Sfardim, you have Moroccans, and you have Tunisians, and you have uh, 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 per Persians, you have uh, all these groups. But we do have one centralizing focus, which is the Torah. We're all focused on the Torah. There's no such thing as, there's no such thing as, what do you call it? Those are things as, as a, a, a Torah group that's not focused, the central point. And that's what's happening over here. So the group shouldn't be divided up. Everybody is focused on one central cause, which is the Mishkan. Very good, very good, Aaron. Now, one last point. There's a Gemara that says, in the future, now which, which future it's talking about exactly, the Messianic period or the world to come, not clear. It says, in the future, all the tzaddikim are going to be in a circle. They're going to go around Hashem, and everybody's going to point into the middle. They're going to say, Ze Hashem kivinu lo nagilo Everybody's going to be pointing. Everybody's going to be pointing to the middle. The tzaddikim are going to be in a circle. They're all going to be pointing. So I heard from Rav Zev Lef. He said, why do they have to go around in a circle? Why can't everybody stand in their place and just point? This is Hashem, who, Ze Hashem, who we always hope for. Ze Hashem kivinu lo. Nagila will rejoice with his redemption. Why can't everybody stand in their place? Why if they go around in a circle? The answer is that do you respect all, Jews, all, all, all groups of Judaism? Do you respect Litvax? Do you respect Svartim? Do you respect Hasidim? Do you respect all groups? I respect all groups. Nod, Ellen. We, 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 all, we all respect each other. Right? We all respect each other. I respect Svartim. I respect Hasidim. I respect Litvax. But in my heart of hearts, in, in my heart of hearts, which is, the, which is the real group? There you go. And in your heart of hearts, which is the real go group? Smart. And in your heart of hearts, it's like, I respect all, yeah, I respect all groups. But, you know, if Mish when Mashiach comes, they're all going to be like me. <laughs> we all think. <laughs> How do you picture Mashiach? How do you picture Mashiach? Oh, definitely with a suit and a tie. Right? And the Svartim picture him with, you know, looking like Rebbe Vadya Yosef. Right? And, and, and the Hasidim, they're definitely a Strimal. Are you kidding? Come on, for sure, Strimal and Payas. So, so every, everybody's got their image of what, what, I respect all groups. Comes along the Gemara. The Gemara says, you know what's going to happen in the future? Everybody's going to go around in a circle. You know why a circle? Because I'll be standing where you are right now, and I'll see it from your perspective. And I'll see that your service of HaKadosh Baruch from your perspective was the correct service. And you'll see it from my perspective, and you'll see it from his perspective. We'll all be good, and we'll all see that everybody had a legitimate way of serving HaKadosh Baruch from their, with their group and their abilities and their life circumstances, except one condition. One condition. You have to be in the circle. You're not automatically in the circle. The Gemara says the tzaddikim, will be in the circle. What is a tzaddik? A tzaddik, by the way, gentlemen, does not have to be 
a, an old person who, who, you know, with a long white beard, we, we, we think of a tzaddik. A tzaddik is somebody who is loyal to Torah. That's a tzaddik. If you're loyal to Torah, you're in the circle. If you abandon Torah, and you, that group is not going to be there. The Hasidim will be there. The, the Moroccans will be there. The Litvax will be there. The groups that abandon Torah, unfortunately, they're not going to be there. And therefore, the Torah says in the second year, they split up into groups, so there shouldn't be any factionalism. We're all on the same team. Everybody on the team has a different job. All right. See you tomorrow.